Safer Chemicals Podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals. Welcome to the Safer Chemicals Podcast. My name is Päivi Jokiniemi. As the last meeting of ECA's Biosidal Products Committee for 2021 has just ended, we'll now take a closer look at the topics discussed. But before that, let's quickly go through the role of the committee. So when companies apply to get their biocidal active substances approved, or have their biocidal products authorized across the whole EU, individual EU member states check and evaluate applications. Then it's the Biocidal Products Committee that forms an opinion on the evaluation. These opinions are sent to the European Commission, which takes the final decision on whether or not to approve the substance for biocidal use. With me in the studio, I have Erik van der Plasche, chair of the Biocidal Products Committee. Thanks for joining us again, Erik. Thanks. I'd like to start with the request that the committee received from the European Commission. This request was done for two active substances for which you have actually already earlier adopted an opinion. But now the Commission has come back to you and is asking you to assess the risks to human health and the environment uh, due to their endocrine disrupting properties. I understand that this is the first time the Biocidal Products Committee has been asked to do this, right? Yeah, that's true, uh, Paivi, indeed. This was the first time that we had to discuss this uh, topic of a risk assessment due to the fact that an active substance is identified as an endocrine uh, disruptor. And as you said, it concerns two actives. Uh, The first one is called DBNPA, uh, which is used in the food processing industry as a disinfectant. When you use it in vessels, you uh, rinse those vessels and then it might end up in the environment. And of course, also operators might be exposed, but also the general public via indirect exposure. And the other one was called, uh, is called cyanamide, and that's used in animal husbandry in pig stables to combat on the one hand a uh, specific disease and on the other hand to disinfect uh, the stables and to prevent the, uh, the growth of mosquito larvae, who can transfer uh, diseases. And already before, indeed, we identified those active substances as meeting the uh, criteria for an endocrine disruptor. We submitted those opinions to the Commission, but then the Commission indeed came back to us asking, but what is now the risk due to, to these uh, endocrine disrupting, uh, disrupting properties? We forwarded those questions to the involved uh, evaluating competent authorities, so Denmark for DBNPA and Germany for cyanamide, who really did a lot of work to to come up with an assessment because it is not easy and it is indeed the first time we are doing this. And it's even the first time this is done within a European framework. If you look at other chemicals legislation, We are the first one who's looking into uh, risks due to uh, ED properties as established within the within the EU. It it was a, an intense discussion. It was a long discussion which took a full day. In the end, we we managed to uh, adopt both opinions, and we will send them to the to the Commission. Um, and they are a bit different in in nature, I must say. On the for the DBNPA, we managed to conclude that these risks due to the endocrine disrupting properties can be considered as acceptable because that was the question from the Commission: Can you say something about the level of risk, and can you conclude that these risks are acceptable or not? So that we did for the DBNPA, but for the cyanamide, we could not conclude on the risk due to the uh, ED properties. And just maybe to take first a step back, that what do you do when you are uh, looking at risks due to ED properties? In fact, what do you do in a risk assessment? What we do, first of all, we look at exposure, which is logic. You you look at the uh, concentrations in the environment and the concentrations to which uh, human beings are exposed. But in order to do that, you need a kind of a threshold at which concentration the, the substance can be considered as safe for the environment or safe for human beings. 
And in both cases, we did not manage to derive such a threshold. And a threshold for endocrine disruptors is a, still a controversial topic. If you look at uh, existing guidance on identifying uh, uh, substances as being ED, that's only about the hazard. It, it's only about how do I establish that a substance is an endocrine disruptor, but it doesn't say anything about how to derive such a threshold. And there's even a controversy whether such threshold even exists. And that came for, to a certain extent a bit back in the committee, that there were some members who were really doubting whether a threshold can be established at all. Uh, there were others who said, well, maybe that is, that is possible. But the second question then comes, do we have sufficient data to uh, determine such a threshold? And as the request from the Commission was to uh, derive it based on the available data, and you have to understand that these dossiers were already submitted a long time ago, and that led to the conclusion that in both cases, based on the data we had, we could not establish such a threshold, or we could not even decide whether there was such a threshold. And it has to do with the data available, uh, but also on if we have sufficient data, how do we start from the what we call the point of departure from a toxicological study or from an environmental data set. We have to use certain assessment factors. And we still, in fact, don't know what kind of assessment factors we have to use to derive the safe concentration for human health or for the environment. And I must say, for the environment, it's even more complex, more difficult, because the, the current test methods we have, we in fact only have such a test method for fish. We don't have them for other organisms. And you would like to know, of course, not only for one organism, but for, a, let's call it, a sufficient number of organisms in the environment to see whether there are ED effects and what is then the concentration at which those type of effects are starting to occur. And for the environment, we simply don't know at this point of time how many organisms do we need. And if we, let's say, can decide on the number of organisms, we don't even have the test methods available to establish the, uh, yeah, the safe level in the environment. So all these things uh, made it very difficult to decide on the risk assessment. And that's why we moved to, or we, of course, the ECA, and then uh, discussed within the committee, we moved to a qualitative risk assessment. So we could not do it in a quantitative way. So you have a threshold and you have an exposure, which you can compare and see whether there is a risk. But we move to a, a qualitative way. Maybe to first explain for DBMPA. And DBMPA, there the substance we are dealing with, in fact, is bromide. And DBMPA releases bromide. And bromide is the, the, the substance which is uh, identified as being an endocrine disruptor due to its effects on the thyroid. And bromide is a naturally occurring substance. It is in the sea, it is everywhere, let's say. We are exposed to it. It's in the environment, it's in surface waters, it's in soil, it's in sediment. So what uh, Denmark did, they looked at for human health, they looked at the concentrations in the diet. And for the environment, they looked at uh, natural background concentrations in pristine environments and also at the contribution of anthropogenic sources. With that, looked also at what is now the contribution from the use of DBNPA in the food processing industry, and can I then compare it to the other sources? And what they concluded is that, as well as for human health, so looking at bromide in the diet, as for the environment, looking at natural con occurring concentrations, that this contribution from the biocidal use, so in this case, this in the food processing in industry, the contribution is, let's say, minor compared to other sources. And if we look at our, let's call it our realistic worst case exposure assessment, it's within this natural variation, so concentrations in the diet or concentrations in the environment. And based on that, they concluded that the risks can be considered as acceptable. So in fact, that means we did not really assess the risk due to its, its ED properties, but we used a kind of workaround to still uh, see whether risk can be considered as acceptable. For cyanamide, the story was different because cyanamide is a substance which does not occur by nature in the environment. There are some uh, plants who produce uh, cyanamide uh, by nature and the industry 
is of the opinion that you might argue there's a kind of a natural background concentration, but these plants do not occur everywhere. So in the end, we concluded there is no natural uh, background concentration for cyanamide. There, the only thing we could do is was looking at exposure and then compare that with other, let's say, traditional effects we are, we are seeing. So not ED effects, but other effects. The conclusion was in the end, well, there is no threshold. We do not know at which concentration the exposure can be considered as safe. So there might still be effects, or there might always be effects from the concentration we are seeing. And we were looking at, for example, it's used in manure in, in uh, pig stables. The manure is spread on land. Uh, you might have uh, yeah, residents who are walking in those fields. You might have children playing in those fields. That's for human health, the general public exposure. Uh, for the environment, again, the, the manure is spread on land uh, and the soil uh, below it is exposed to cyanamide and there might be effects occurring. But in the end, it was uh, yeah, decided that we cannot conclude over here. We do not know what the safe level is. We are convinced there is some exposure. It might be low because cyanamide is degraded, degraded in the environment. Uh, you might argue that the manure can be stored and during storage there can also be a degradation. But still, we do not know, in fact, we do not know. And there, the committee didn't want to, to conclude. And even in the working groups where we have all experts available, they did not want to conclude that these exposure concentrations we are seeing can be regarded as safe or acceptable. So there we ended up with an opinion with no conclusion, in fact. While for the DBMPA, there we also had some member states who were still saying, well, we also do not want to conclude like for cyanamide. So we had a controversy in the, in, the, in the meeting. That's in fact what I wanted to say. So for DBNPA, we took a vote and not all members were agreeing with the opinion as it stood. So we have some uh, who are against. And also for the cyanamide, there we did not have a vote, but there we had uh, one minority opinion from a member state who was still convinced that based on the concentrations we are seeing, we could conclude that the risks can maybe be considered as acceptable. So again, I would say yeah, uh, a difficult uh, topic, a difficult discussion. I guess in the end we, we have to look at this experience and see whether we can derive a kind of uh, way forward, a roadmap for something like guidance on how to, uh, to assess the risks coming from ED properties. And yeah, that remains to be seen. So we need to look back at what happened and what we can learn from this experience. But yeah, in fact, as I said, I'm happy that these opinions are uh, adopted. Some, uh, yeah, some against, but uh, yeah, let's see what happens next. How common is it that you have this uh, kind of no conclusion at the end? Well, that, that, is, uh, that is new. We never had that in the committee. We always could conclude on the acceptability of our risks. The only exception we had was the cyanamide and the DBNPA, which we adopted before. And there we also did not conclude on the ED risks. But we still concluded that these uh, substances could be approved under the relevant conditions, let's say. So, but this is really the first time where we submit an opinion to the Commission. And in fact, we had a second uh, question from them on to uh, conclude on the risks. And it's the first time that we have an opinion then for cyanamide where we have no conclusion. So what happens next then? For DBMPA... I think there the, the, the situation is quite clear because there we have a conclusion. To add maybe that also these two dossiers are different. Uh, DBMPA is submitted under the regulation. So there you have this possibility of this, what we call this Article 5.2 derogation. So although the substance is uh, meeting the ED properties, it means that it is an exclusion substance. And in fact, that means that you would like to ban these substances. Mm -hmm because of their hazardous properties. Uh, in the regulation, there is a provision that still you can approve a substance if certain conditions are met. And there are three. And for example, one is that the exposure is so low that you consider these risks coming from this exposure as being negligible. 
The other one can be that socioeconomic aspects are that important. So if you do not approve the substance, that would lead to, let's call it socioeconomic damage, that you would still like to approve the substance. And the crucial question is there whether you have alternatives to substitute this, uh, this substance. So in this case, it will go to the commission. Uh, they have an uh, acceptability of the risk, and they will still they will now have to see whether one of these derogations criteria apply, and if if so, they can approve uh, approve the substance. And for cyanamide, uh, the situation is uh, is different because there they don't have a conclusion from us, so they still will need to decide. And there. The situation is different because this substance was submitted already under the directive. And that means that we will only need to conclude based on the acceptability of the risks. There is no Article 5.2, there is no derogation possibility. And that's of course difficult for the Commission. And they explained it also and said it at the meeting that for them that is an issue that legally they cannot maybe approve the substance because they do not know whether the risks are acceptable or not. Well, for sure, there were members in the, in the committee who were saying, well, looking at the profile of the substance, it's indeed an ED, but it has some potential for degradation that it, the exposure might be low, and there may be further information coming in the, in the future. Yeah, maybe we would still argue that this substance can be approved, but it will be, first of all, a very difficult uh, situation for the Commission to take a decision on what they are going to propose. And then the discussion in the standing committee where all members will be present, that will also be a very, uh, very interesting, uh, an interesting debate. You also uh, adopted an opinion concerning peanut butter and whether this active substance uh, used as an attractant could be included in Annex 1 of the Bicidal Products Regulation. And that means that um, it would be considered of low concern and eligible for a simplified authorization process. Mm. Could you please tell us more about this this discussion and uh, what was the conclusion at the end? Yeah, we, we discussed indeed peanut butter, which which might be quite interesting, let's say. Why do we discuss peanut butter within uh, a forum like the, the committee? But indeed, peanut butter is an attractant. Um, it is used, in, in for example, in, in mice traps. So you have these mechanical traps. And peanut butter is a very good uh, attractant. I must even say I used it recently myself. I live in Holland in an uh, old house and we had a mice. And I bought a mechanical trap and I put some peanut butter in and I catched, uh, I catched him. So it, it works quite well. Um, but the question indeed is, was, uh, yeah, is, is peanut butter eligible for what we call then Annex 1 inclusion? And it means then that it doesn't give rise to concern. It's indeed uh, a substance with low risks. Uh, and then it can be eligible for what is called a simplified procedure. So then a company only needs to notify that they do not have to uh, have this complex normal authorization process. Yeah, in the end, we still concluded that peanut butter cannot be included in, uh, in Annex 1. It's not eligible. The reason for this is that some people are allergic to peanuts. That's uh, quite uh, an important uh, effect, and it means that uh, uh, peanut butter is immunotoxic. And if you look at all the criteria before a substance is eligible for Annex 1 inclusion, immunotoxicity is one of them. And so in principle, it does not meet the, uh, the criteria for, for Annex 1 inclusion. I guess everybody knows, especially people who are allergic to peanuts, these are heavy reactions you can, uh, you can see. So, for example, there are, under national systems, let's say, there are uh, traps on markets, we heard, for example, in Greece, where it's mentioned on the package where you have this rodent trap with peanut butter in it that people are warned so that people who are allergic do not use these kind of uh, traps or at least are very careful when they, when they use them. And especially, that, of course, that can be uh, important for children who are allergic to, uh, to peanuts. But in principle, our discussion was, uh, well, in the end, quite straightforward. It does not meet the criteria, so it cannot be included. On the other hand, we were the rapporteur as an agency. We had some considerations from, let's call, the proportionality point of view. Well, 
might we not still then consider to be included in Annex 1 because you can take these kind of measures. You might even restrict it to rodent traps or to insect traps with child-resistant uh, bait boxes. Or there were uh, members arguing that you can put this indeed on the package, you can put this on refill packages, you can put this on the trap itself. But in the end, uh, yeah, we have our legal uh, provisions, we have the BPR, and strictly looking at the criteria, uh, the substance cannot be included on Annex 1, and in the end that's what we decided, and I'm very sure that the Commission is going to take this over and that this substance is not going to be included in Annex 1. And that means that the company will have to submit a normal dossier as an attractant under the BPR, and then there will, in the end, and we're quite convinced of that, that there will be a normal approval for this, uh, for this substance. And then um, there was guidance on rodent traps developed by the German Environment mm. Agency. Perhaps you can tell a little bit about this too. Yeah, that's uh, again about traps. This is all related to the anticoagulant rodenticides, which is a, a well-known class of rodenticides, which are meeting, that's, uh, everybody knows now, these exclusion criteria, so we would like to get rid of those substances, although we also need them on the other hand. But uh, there is a big incentive to use more mechanical traps for rodent control. And a couple of years ago, the German uh, environmental agency, the Umweltbundesamt, they started a project on how to assess uh, mechanical traps, to look first of all about the mechanics of the trap, but also on the efficacy, on the effectiveness of using uh, mechanical traps to, uh, yeah, to combat an, uh, a rat or a mice uh, infestation. And with mechanical, you mean that there is no chemicals? No chemical involved, only the attractant to attract uh, the animal to the trap. But uh, indeed, it's like, uh, yeah, I guess everybody has seen them and yeah. used them. You have them from wood, but nowadays you have them even more let's say, more sophisticated one, even with, with uh, yeah, video control to, to observe whether there is a mice in or a rat in such a trap, especially used in the food processing uh, aid industry. Mm. But coming back to this guidance, that uh, uh, so in Germany this guidance was uh, developed, and the whole idea behind this is also to come to a kind of an authorization system to have only good quality traps who really work, and who only do not work one time, but work a lot of times, and who also kill humanely, uh, because that's often a problem with Swiss traps in the past. Now, uh, the Commission asked us to look at this guidance, because if we are going to compare the rodenticides, the chemicals, with these non-mechanical uh, alternatives, they need to be based on the same principles. At least that is the idea. And the Commission asked us to look into this, and that's what we did, and that's where we delivered an opinion on. And in the end, we concluded that, yes, uh, the principles which we use for chemicals, and of course, the, uh, in Germany, when they developed this guidance, they already looked at the guidance which we have for chemicals. And in fact, they, they, uh, yeah, they established and they used the same principles. And that's what we concluded, and that gives, of course greater, let's say, certainty when we are going to compare the, uh, the rodenticides with these, uh, with these alternatives, which will happen in the near future because we are under the renewal process of these rodenticides, these uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. We have to carry out what is called a comparative assessment, and that means that we compare uh, these chemicals with uh, the non-chemical uh, the, the non alternatives, so these rodent traps. And that's where the guidance will be useful, and that's going to happen uh, next year. So this is an important step in, uh, yeah, let's call it promoting uh, alternatives to, uh, to chemical uh, rodenticides. And finally, um, there were some active substance and union authorization mm -hmm. applications. Yeah. What would you like to highlight from these discussions? Maybe a couple of things. The union authorizations were not that controversial, not that much discussions. We had two. We uh, proposed to authorize them both. Maybe interesting from one of them was that this was the second time we had the same application. So the first application, we came to a non-authorization proposal. And now the company came back and we uh, com came up with a proposal to authorize. And that was simply due to the fact because maybe 
the audience might think if you do not authorize, this is based on the fact that you consider it is very risky, let's say. It, it's too risky to, to authorize such a product. But in this case, uh, we could not uh, sufficiently assess the efficacy of the, uh, of the product. Um, and the information was simply not there in the dossier, and we have to take a decision within, within a certain time limit. So there we recommended non-authorization because we could not demonstrate that, or we could not, the dossier didn't demonstrate that this product was efficacious. And then the company came back, they applied again, and they came with the information we needed, and that was considered as being sufficient, so now we have an authorization uh, proposal. And then maybe the last thing to mention of the meeting is the uh, discussion we had on one active substance, which is called ozone. And that's uh, a substance which uh, yeah, many people know nowadays because ozone is also used as uh, a disinfectant. And also in this corona crisis, you hear a lot about uh, ozone uh, disinfection. Ozone uh, is generated in situ from, uh, from oxygen. You can do that from ambient air, you can do that from water, you can do that from uh, oxygen, uh, liquid oxygen provided in, in canisters. And uh, we had an application for product type 2, product type 4, 5 and 11. And to explain that a bit more, it's used then in swimming pools or hot tubs for disinfection, applied for the general public and for professionals and swimming pools used by professionals but also by the yeah used by the general public in their in their homes let's say in the food processing industry in breweries drinking water disinfection but again then only used by professionals and for disinfection of cooling water and the main topic was the uh, disinfection of uh, swimming pools and hot tubs and then for the general public and let's say ozone is a dangerous substance. It's classified for its mutagenic properties and its carcinogenetic properties. Uh, not yet that we have a harmonized classification, but there was a proposal in the dossier by Germany, the rapporteur, which will soon go to the risk assessment uh, committee to, uh, to conclude uh, or to at least have an opinion on the classification for ozone. But it, it's clear it meets certain uh, classification criteria which makes it difficult, if not legally not allowed, to, uh, to authorize products for the general public. We have this condition in the legislation, Article 19.4 it is called. And yeah, there was on the one hand an assessment for use by the general public. Uh, you have to understand you have certain devices who generate uh, ozone. For the general public, you would need to put them in a separate room which cannot be entered, for example, by children. You have a kind of an alarm system that if the concentration of ozone becomes too high, an alarm will go up, go off, and the device will stop. So there are all kinds of, let's say, conditions who would prevent uh, exposure to the, yeah, to the general public who use these kind of uh, devices. So there was a proposal from Germany in it to allow this for the general public but legally it's very difficult to uh, yeah to, to to have this approved for the general public so again we had a discussion in the committee the commission was quite clear i must say that they do not think this is legally possible to allow it for for non-professional use we have a note now in the opinion that this needs to be investigated further at, uh, at commission level. So when we uh, yeah, submit the opinion to the, to the next stage, there were some members in the committee who were doubting whether this cannot be legally interpreted in an other way. Because in fact, the ozone is produced, but it's not made available to you. Uh, you can, let's say, prevent exposure of happening. It's not like an insecticide which you use, you have a, a spray and then uh, you are exposed to it. But here you have some, yeah, it's not made available, let's say, because you have this in situ generation also. So there are different kinds of legal interpretations maybe in member states. The commission was quite, quite clear that they do not think this, uh, this will be possible and this can be allowed. And it will have a big impact for the market because you, you have these devices, uh, yeah, there, there, are, there, there are quite many in the EU. We have, because we have in fact two dossiers, we have one from Germany and one from the Netherlands, and we know there are also other applications for the, for the general public. So this might have a big impact. 
And uh, yeah, again, it, it remains to be seen uh, what is going to happen at uh, commission level. But the, uh, as I said, the, the message from the commission was quite clear in this respect. And your uh, opinion was at the end? Our opinion was that it can be approved, but we do not approve of, let's, let's put it in another way, there's also this, this professional use. Yeah. So for sure it can be approved for professionals where you have to take similar measures. And when, uh, when we can approve for professional use, we have an approval. And for the approval, we do not need to say whether it can then not be approved for the general public. That comes at product authorization. So we can approve the substance, but it might happen that you will have no authorization for these kind of products intended for the general public. Thank you, Eric, for sharing some of the highlights with us. And we will be back with more insights from the committee next year. The first meeting will take place during the first week of March 2022. Until then, you can find more information about our committees on our website at eka.europa.eu and all episodes of the Safer Chemicals podcast are available on your favorite podcast channel. Safer Chemicals podcast. Sound science on harmful chemicals. Thank you.